sound that saved to wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. Was blind, but now. I remember entering Project Hope. People were warm, they were welcoming, there were smiles, and I was saying to myself, they don't know me. I'm at the worst time in my life. Um, you know, who, who are they? And um, they don't know me, why do they care? Nobody loves me. In a culture that really overemphasizes control, um, self-sufficiency, independence, every person for himself or herself, mutuality is absolutely radical. We are taught from a very early age that the way to be successful in the world is to make sure that we have control over almost anything, uh, over our bodies, um, over other people. When we're in organizations, many people measure their success by saying how many people report to me. And for, unfortunately, for a lot of people, that means how many people do I control? This documentary explores the values and practices of mutuality and what mutuality looks like in organizations, communities, and in the wider society. You know, the, at the core of mutuality is a hard word to define. It's a popular word, so you'd think, oh, I know what mutuality is. It's you give me, I'll give you. That's more reciprocity. I've got some friends with some real problems. Oh, how I wish that I could solve them. Some friends with some real problems, and I listen, I listen to them. Mutuality is totally about respect and totally about trust. It's saying, I'm going to open myself to being impacted by you, to being influenced by you, and I believe that that's going to lead to growth for both of us. Mutuality is saying, we're creating this together. We're creating this together. And mutual empathy is, you're impacting me, I'm impacting you. We don't exactly know what the outcome of that's gonna be. We have to open ourselves to the trust that something good is gonna happen from this collaboration and from this mutual exchange. Most of the time when we think about mutuality, we are talking about some sort of a quid pro quo exchange. But the essence of mutuality is openness to change. And in order to do that, you have to be ready, willing, to uh, allow someone to have an influence in your life. I mean, empathy is a terribly important human skill. For a long time, it was treated as a kind of fluff, you know, oh, she's just a nice person. Oh, she's kind. 
And there's nothing wrong with being kind and nice. That's a good thing in my book. But empathy really involves that human bridge, that sense of, I get you. I get you, and you get me. And that feels so good. What does it look like when an organization practices the values of mutuality? Project Hope, based in the Boston neighborhood of Dorchester, has a deliberate culture of mutuality in their work with women struggling with homelessness. In um, 78, I moved to Boston um, with my husband. We were both very young. My son was born premature, and I remember at the hospital meeting a social worker who would then do home visits. She realized that there were some issues in the home. We began to build a relationship together, and I think I began to trust her. This worker became a prominent individual in my life to help to shape my life going forward. All I remember was picking up the phone and calling her and saying to her, you need to come and get me. And the next thing I knew, she was taking me to this place called Project Hope. Sister Margaret Leonard is one of the founders of Project Hope. For her, mutuality is a way of life and the approach she has brought to the organizational culture of Project Hope. Well, I think the, the concept of mutuality has been with me from the very beginning of my life. I think I wasn't conscious of calling it that language until I went to graduate school. But I think it began because I was born a twin. And you know, there's something about being, uh, being born a twin, which meant that every moment of your life from the very beginning, you shared life with another person. So when I think of mutuality, I think of the recognition that in a relationship with another, we are both givers and receivers, and that our life is kind of spent in that kind of way. And so it was like a root consciousness in me that no matter who you connected with, it was another human person with whom you can engage in a relationship in which you receive from them and share with them. So it was part of my whole sense of identity. Researchers at the Jean Baker Miller Center at Wellesley College have been studying the psychology and science of mutuality for several decades. Originally based on the work of Jean Baker Miller, relational cultural practice names and celebrates the power of connection in people's lives. We grow through and toward connection throughout our lives. We are healthier, stronger, and more productive together. I think mutuality is, is our kind of innate state, you know? It's how we operate most effectively. The majority of us, there may be some outliers, but the majority of us really work best in mutual relationships. But that means, uh, re for us adults, relearning how to be in relationships, right? Because we, we didn't learn mutuality as how to be in relationships, you know? We had a whole generation of assertiveness training for women <laughs> right? A whole generation of, you know, climbing the uh, tower for men. And we need to get out there and learn a different way. So when we use the term hardwired, we're really talking about the, you know, it's the background of how we are all operating in our lives. If we weren't hardwired to connect, actually solitary confinement wouldn't be like the worst punishment, right? Because you'd just be there self-regulating. But no, what we know is people get sick, they die, they get psychotic, right? Out of the stress of being alone. So when we're isolated, when we feel silenced, when we feel shamed, 
We are very open to being manipulated by other people and oppressed. And if we're constantly feeling like we can't speak our truths, we can't speak our truths to power, we can't speak our truths anywhere, we are in fact um, losing our own authenticity, losing uh, the power of being in relationship. Now, most of the time when we think of empathy, we think about people sort of feeling good together and feeling with, and, and that's good, that's a part of it, and, but I think we rob empathy of its power if that's where we leave it. Empathy, it's really about radical respect, standing in awe of and with a curious stance towards someone who is totally different from you and allowing that difference to emerge, allowing the difference into relationships so that the whole relational space expands and possibilities expand for everyone. Someday I just might get it together. I don't know. I think the irony is, is that's, you know, when that's a, an intricate part of that mutuality and practicing it. But once we're able to do that, and I think for me, you know, I would say I feel I'm confident enough to be vulnerable, to say I don't know how to do this, or I, I need some help, or how can I, how can I help you even, I think is, is a way of being vulnerable. Because often people have this way of, I know what you need. But I think just asking, how can I help you? is another way of being vulnerable. For me, and I can go back to the beginning when I made the decision to leave my ex-husband, that was my first time really making myself vulnerable. And I did that by asking for help, by reaching out, by telling the truth, by saying what really happened. And you know, that's what we, we need to do. You know, not enough, not enough people do that. Over the past decade, we have learned from advances in brain science that we are wired for mutuality, that we thrive in relationship to one another. We are also wounded by social exclusion, prejudice, racism, and this registers the same way physical pain does in our brain. There are a lot of skeptics out there who actually don't want to hear this message. Um, some people are threatened by it. Some people fear that it will um, imbalance power arrangements that now exist, uh, that it's just wishful thinking. We've been saying isolation hurts. Isolation creates suffering for people. The idea that social pain, the pain of exclusion, can be measured, can be tracked, can be seen in functional MRIs in the same way that physical pain is, is, is very powerful data. What's been very exciting for us at the Gene Baker Miller Institute is that um, the theories that were proposed you know, 30 years ago, that relationships are really central to health and well-being for um, all people, is now being supported by this um, science. You know, what we're finding is that there are a number of different, literally pathways, neural pathways that are dedicated to connection. There's a whole uh, science now um, called spot theory, social pain overlap theory, um, that actually tells us that the pain pathway, literally the, the pathway that measures the distress of physical pain is the exact same pathway that measures the distress for social pain. And now we have sort of a common understanding of why being socially, socially rejected or teased or bullied or you know any of the isms that we know, racism and all of that, actually impairs health. can't look at that and say, oh, you're making up this story about marginalization and how it hurts people. Say, no, marginalization hurts people. We respond empathically. We respond with other people's feelings. It's very big. It's very important. And it's gone, impressively puzzled by right and wrong. 
when I went to medical school 25 years ago, I was told, you know, in my neurology class, you know, you're born with this number of nerves and, you know, life is about knocking them off slowly and surely until you kind of slide into kind of dementia and old age. In 1998, the guy by the name of Erickson discovered for the first time that actually areas of the brain can create brand new nerves, and that's unheard of. That is like, you know, water on Mars in terms of, you know, the, how rigidly held the belief was that the nervous system couldn't regenerate. Along with this is kind of now the belief and the knowledge about how our brains change. And it's easy. Use it or lose it. Neurons that wire together fire together. So if you think of all of, you know, we have literally, call it a roadmap, call it the neural pathways or whatever you want. You have billions of neurons in your brain, each one of them connected to 10,000 other nerves. You know, this, this just diffuse interconnected thing up in your head. And that is changing every single second of the day. Because like today, you and I are having this conversation. My brain right now is being changed by what your face is doing, by the light coming in. Um, you're being changed by what you hear, by smells. All of this, it's just constantly morphing. The more you stimulate a pathway, the stronger it grows. And the more you stimulate a pathway, like pathways that are stimulated with it, kind of make interconnections. You know, sort of like you would in relationships. Right? The people you interact with, those relationships usually get stronger. So what we know is that with the right information and the right set of, you know, we'll call it techniques or strategies, you can actually rework these pathways. I happen to believe that we are intrinsically compassionate and caring beings. And there's data now that supports this, that we are born with a, the capacity for empathic responsiveness. We're hardwired, we have mirror neurons, uh, there have been studies done of babies that show that babies cry in response to the distressed cry of other babies. We are wired to resonate. We are wired to care. Mutuality is not only expressed on a one-to-one -one level, but also within and between groups of people. The same principles of profound connections are possible on a larger scale. We see this at the level of loving families, caring neighborhoods, or organizations such as Project Hope, which have internalized the qualities of mutuality and found ways to deepen and foster relationships based on these principles. As it becomes more rooted, the experience of mutuality becomes contagious, inspiring a desire and creativity to spread it even further. I lived at Project Hope, being homeless with my son, totally disconnected from me any other family member, and I lived there for about four months. I remember when I was leaving, the executive director then uh, was Sister Margaret Leonard, and I had said to her, going out the door, if a position ever becomes available, I would like to come back and work at this organization. I remember in East Harlem that I was in graduate school. At Fordham University, I went for my master's degree in social work. And one of the courses was, what were the eight basic principles of a relationship? And it was respect and, oh, just a whole range of principles. But there wasn't one about mutuality. So I thought, I have to write an article about this. And the professors were really thrilled with it and invited me to get it published. And then I went from graduate school to the East Harlem community. We did a number of wonderful things in East Harlem. And I, you know, when I think about this, I just think of, you had Mount Sinai Hospital, which was considered probably one of the premier hospitals in New York at that period of time. And there was a fellow by the name of Kurt Duschel who created the community medicine department in East Harlem. And then the doctors said, 
we need to learn so much more from this neighborhood about how to deliver health care. So as a result of our orientation and being engaged with them, we brought them into the neighborhood, into local clinics that were in church basements, into a whole range of places. Uh, we set up a dialogue with the, uh, in the bodegas with people from the Spanish community that had developed a whole new way of looking at dealing with mental health issues. And so we began to do a kind of co-learning process and then what was possible in, in the native development of the spiritista, you know, the spiritual leaders in, in the Latino community. So there were a number of experiences like that that made me realize there's something that's really critical in this whole concept of mutuality. I remember my first experience as a One Family Scholar, spending a weekend at a retreat with 24 women. It was 20, 23 other women. And for that, that weekend, I, you know, in reflection, so it was the first time in my entire life that I spent time with women of my choice, women that shared my values, which were to take care of our children, to provide, to pave a path, and do that through education. I did that and eventually was nominated and invited to um, join the board of directors. You know, I grew up um, in a culture that children had to do what their parents told them to do, regardless. And I remember thinking as a child how wrong my parents would be for some things, but I had to do it. Um, but I've learned to practice mutuality within my family and I've grown. I've learned so much more about myself just from doing that. I think that. My children are able to um, see things that I don't, and they have a, a, a really fresh perspective on things. You know, they say women don't support women. Well, bullshit. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> because I have watched you all for over 15 years plus doing just that. One of the programs that I think was really kind of most significant and still runs today is that you had all these young mothers that were coming from Puerto Rico. Some of them were single parents. Some of them had um, husbands or significant others that they were living with. They came into a neighborhood that was really very complex, and they didn't really know how to even move ahead. And in the same neighborhood was a whole group of grandmothers, abuelas as they would call them in, in East Harlem or in Spanish. And uh, I thought, God, if we could make a linkage between these young women and these abuelas and look at how they, we could build a relationship with help those young women to survive and develop and grow in the East Harlem communities. Crazy how my life changed so fast, many different ways. But you guys made me who I am today. I for my diamonds. I for my diamonds. I've been employed at Project Hope now for 23 years this summer. I think Project Hope is a very unique organization in the way in which we work with poor families because they may be poor economically, but they are rich in so many other things. It's important for them to be a part of those decisions that affect their lives. If it's gonna be that we're gonna paint a room or we're gonna buy furniture, or we're gonna have an activity that we engage them because this is about their life. What does it look like when mutuality is practiced at the neighborhood level? Another organization that practices the values of mutuality is the Dudley Street Neighborhood Initiative, DSNI, a community planning and organizing institution located down the street from Project Hope. I think that a lot is happening 
in this community, and I think Project Hope as well as DSNI, we're all a part of that. We're merging it together. And so I, I think that's, that's very exciting. Rosa, what are you bringing? Frutas, mira. Oh. I'm going to talk about the promise surrounding the ability for organizations to break down laws so our families get what they need. When we, when we try to live out a community where people are at the table, respecting each other, um, and actually, in fact, I, I like to think about, um, there's an African word, umbutu, uh, that means that I am because you are, um, that, that I exist because you exist. And in fact, when we try to live out the umbutu principle here in the neighborhood, we find ourselves um, helping people understand the decisions that are important uh, in how it affects other people. And so at that, at that core, at the, at the collaborative level, um, those, those community stakeholders are working to make sure that decisions that are made for one part of the community is in the best interest of all members of the community. DSNI, at its heart, uh, believes that uh, we are more together, that believes in the collective wisdom, that believes in the common good, um, and that we have this shared destiny. Everything that we do helps to uh, build that sense of mutuality um, across uh, a very diverse neighborhood. The Dudley Youth Council uh, does um, a radio show and they have tackled all the tough topics, right? Um, including race, including how we look at each other. And so in many ways, I think that um, by acknowledging the difference and the diversity, we actually look for what's common. Um, and so we don't shy away from it. Some of us shy away more than others, but, <laughs> but as an organization, I think that we embrace the, um, the conversations, we recognize what's special and different about each other while looking for uh, where we're going together. You know, one of the most important things about mutuality and mutual empathy is it empowers not just the individuals participating, but it, it empowers the community. People feel like, yeah, I can do something, rather than, what are you going to do? You know, it's, it's, the world is tough. Human nature is dark. My sense is that it's got to start with these relationships spreading out the ripple effect so more and more people are feeling like they're respected, they're honored, they matter. We all want to matter. We want to make a difference. So in areas where you, where you don't have that kind of um, relationship or um, the sense of mutual or linked destiny, and, and you're not acting upon that, you, you, you have people who feel typically disenfranchised, oppressed, um, that they have to uh, fight against the system, there's less trust of police, there's less trust of authority, there is um, a set of behaviors that are detrimental to the, to the common good because the common good is not part of my, my good and it's not part of, of, of who I am. I get nothing from it, it's not linked to me. And that's a really destructive sense of belonging or, di or, or not belonging to a place. Take a shot, shot, do it now. No emotions, no emotions, no emotions, no emotions. I show no emotions, I feel no emotions. No emotions, no emotions, no emotions. I show no emotions, I feel no emotions. No emotions. I think one of the concepts that we've developed 
through our leadership, sort of our seeking of how to maximize uh, the, the development of leadership within the community, is this idea of how we look at power. Um, because in a lot of cases, I think that's what um, can get in the way. And so we look at power as transformative. We look at power as more when it's shared as opposed to if you have it, I don't, so I want my voice to um, overwhelm yours and I'm gonna figure out how to do that. No, actually, um, we are trying to develop both the culture and the ways that, um, that we can be more together. Most of the wonderful change I've seen, most of the social change that's brought liberation to people was initiated and enacted by people who don't have the power to do it. If you were to look at just ordinary, our ordinary view of power and dominance and control, if we think about work that has been done in black freedom movements, women's suffrage, um, gay rights, uh, most of the time people who get that work started and people who sustain the work are the people who are told that you really aren't very powerful and you really don't count here. I happen to have grown up with a, a woman who had none of the sort of material or sort of social markers of power. And I think most of what I learned about power, I, I learned from her. My mother was a domestic worker in the South in the 1950s and 60s. I've never seen a woman yet in all of these decades who inhabited her power with more dignity and who commanded more respect from people, which makes me know, and again, we, we, we talk about just broader movements, most of the good change that happens is initiated by people who say, I can do this. And while the world is saying they can't do it. I learned a great deal from liberation theology that came out of Latin America that really held to key principles, and one of those is when you deal with the poverty and the solutions to poverty, you ask the question, why? And when you're working at solutions, you ask, who are you doing this with? And you, people who are poor have to be architects of their own destiny, so you do it in collaboration with them. Practicing mutuality has some very real challenges in a world that is continuously confronted with war, aggression, poverty, competition, and all kinds of human suffering and inequality. These streams challenge the principles of mutuality and can predominate in our social structures. Yet, mutuality has the power to respond to even these most difficult aspects of our society. In fact, it may be the only way for us to truly address social issues that have been threatening the well-being of humanity for a long time. So when I came to Project Hope, it was one of Boston's poorest neighborhoods, and it was a garbage dump, and it was slated for gentrification, and there was all this vacant land all over the place. And then the people that we used to know had no way to live, so we said, come in and live with us. So that meant men, women, and children living with a bunch of nuns. What impact does the larger society and economy have on mutuality? In recent decades, has growing income and wealth inequality affected our society and the possibilities of mutuality? More and more, I would, we're living in a period of what I would characterize as extreme inequalities of income and wealth. Uh, and, and at the same time, I think our culture is very tolerant of those inequalities. Uh, people believe that they're justified in some way. Because I think those inequalities underlie a whole lot of things that are going wrong 
right now in the United States, whether it's education or uh, the role of government or the quality of our lives. What's going on? Why is it that there's a 1%, a wealthy class that's sort of pulled apart? And I grew up in the 1%, so I happen to know there's a lot of people in the 1% who, who uh, are very concerned about and devote their whole lives to creating good societies and education and opportunity for all. And there's a segment of the 1% that I think have hardened their hearts or have created or live within a mythology of individual achievement and uh, have created a an ideology or a story that means that they don't have to feel and empathize with others. Uh, and they spend a lot of their time perpetuating their wealth and power, using their wealth and power to, to get more wealth and power. One of the things that happens when a society becomes extremely unequal is there's a breakdown in solidarity between people. So in most communities, if there's something goes wrong, people say, we're in it together or an injury to me is an injury to you. I feel something when you, are, you lose your home. I feel something when you become sick and I want to do something about that. And I think that is our nature. But when we become too unequal, when our society stretches out too far, there's a breakdown in that empathy and solidarity. And I think what happens with the people at the very, very wealthy pinnacle of the society is they delink. They withdraw to a sort of uh, privatized paradise or a, a fortress in a, in a sense and are delinked not only from others but from the suffering of others and then they create stories that either rationalize their privilege or distance themselves from suffering. And part of that distancing could be charity. I'm going to give money over here, and it, but I'm not going to feel the experience of my neighbor's pain. Sister Margaret talks about this when she talks about building bridges across class and difference and race. People are isolated. Uh, a f one out of four people, adults in this country, have no one they can talk to uh, about the things that are most important to them. No one they can turn to when they feel economic anxiety. And another one out of four have only one person, often a spouse, and if that person goes away, they're part of that, what, what Duke University calls socially isolated group. So half the population has very few, does not have a, a sense of kinship network or tribe or community to fall back on. And that means a lot of people are vulnerable. So a big part of the work is breaking down that isolation. Come out, come away from the TV, come away from the computer screen, meet, meet your neighbors, creating space for people to know one another, know one another's needs, and begin to practice asking for help. I think there are communities and people all around who, who live by these different values. You know? And I think of a lot of new immigrants come to this country and they come with a culture of solidarity and mutuality intact and they that's how they survive that transition. A lot of low-income people have to depend on each other, have to ask for help, have to be interdependent to survive. Inequality undermines mutuality, but can we reduce inequality through mutual connection and empathy? I met a man named Hank at a book event I was going to, and he, he came up to me afterwards. I talked sort of about inequality and how it leads to this breakdown in society. And he said, you know, um, I used to be a senior executive at, at Boeing. You know, here I worked at this global corporation and I was involved in all kinds of decisions, but I was trained as an engineer. So when I retired, I went to Kenya to help these villages build water treatment plants. And so he's, he's off in Kenya and he's with a church group and he's applying his engineering skills to fixing these water treatment plants. And he looks around, and there's like 20 kids all standing around watching him. And he says, well, where do you kids live? And they say, oh, we live over there at the such and such a house. And he says, oh, show me where you live. And he take, they take them to his house, and it's an orphanage. And they're just curious, and they just want to help. And so he's got them moving rocks and doing things. And next thing you know, he says, maybe I came here not to build a dam. Maybe I came here to meet these kids. He 
he says in his words, his heart was completely cracked open. He came up to me, he's like 75, he's, he's crying, he's saying, all I think about are these kids. I've organized delegations, we've built three orphanages. Why did it have to be, why did I have to wait till I was 75 to have my heart cracked open in a way that made me understand my real purpose was to help these children? And why do I have to go from Los Angeles to Kenya when it's all around me? He says, my whole life has changed. My whole purpose in life has changed. So here was a guy who, who lived the privileged life, but somehow was transformed. And that in turn transformed his whole relationship to his community and what he does. I think that's, that's when I see transformation happening. Not only are transformations happening at an individual level, but also we've seen examples of people across the earth collaborating in response to needs. Hundreds of nations are now concerned about the well-being of our earth and the impact of global warming. There are hundreds of other examples of ways in which we are connecting with one another based on mutuality, which are shifting values and ways of operating across systems, counties, countries, and other human boundaries. There's phenomenal potential to grow this kind of thinking all around the world. And I think it can clearly help us to change the world and to make it a place that's more just and loving and equitable for all the peoples of the earth and particularly those at the bottom. I'd love to push the reset button, right, and go back you know, 50,000 years and, and try to do it again, or even, you know, 250 years and, uh, from whenever the settlers came in and we started that mass pilgrimage across America in the whole definition of, you know, how strong and, you know, kind of wonderful we are in our, in our independence. Short of doing that, I think the science really gives us an opportunity to educate you know, to really sort of show in concrete terms, in brain imaging studies, in health studies, it sort of brings, brings a lot of things together. What if we began to teach this to our teachers? To, maybe not our corporations quite yet, although they probably need it most, but to our students in kindergarten, as I like to say, what if, what if when kids are le learning, when they go to the pediatrician, if they're learning, you know, or being asked, you know, how are you doing, uh, you know, wearing your bicycle helmet? And are you wearing your seatbelt? And how are you doing with your friendships? That also keeps you healthy, right? You know, there are ways that we could use this science to sort of do an autocorrect and get people, you know, it's, it's sort of clicking back into where they actually belong biologically. Um, it takes a massive <laughs> effort, obviously, and this is part of it. I mean, I, you know, I think there are pro programs that are doing it. The Pro Project Hope is doing it, and there, there are people all over the world, not just people at the Gene Baker Miller Training Institute, people really all over the world that are doing this, and I think we all need to come together and sort of name it as what we're doing. I was asked to chair an international commission of my religious congregation to really look at groups of people that are organized with the sisters in several countries of the world. And it was a commission that brought together women and men, and we met once or twice a year. And one of the things we did was to really identify all the different groups that are engaged with us. And one of the things we really found is that they believe in the same principle that reflect what we do in Worcester, what we do in New York, what we do here. There is a common identity among all of these people who are engaged in mission with us. So that helped us then look at how do we network these different groups all around the world? And how do we take this common identity and grow it 
And the other thing that was linked to that is that we have what we call a Secretariat for Justice and Peace. And now we have a presence as an NGO at the United Nations. And we're looking at the information that we gather from around the world. How do we bring that message so that it has an impact at the level of the United Nations? You know, something I think a number of years ago, we tried to kind of put together, I think it was back in the 60s, in the late 60s or early 70s in, in East Island, we tried to find a way of expressing what this meant. And we wrote this poem that was actually written on the side of our building, and we still have it now, and it still really makes a great deal of sense, but it's called The Power of Growth is in Relationship. The power of growth is in relationship. Even when life seems frail, when there is darkness and pain and confusion and complexity, the loving and caring of a human person can be sunlight and warmth to the growth power of another human person. Helping another creates meaning and hope in both persons. Being sunlight and warmth to another's life nurtures growth in both. To this growth we are pledged. All of humanity has a divine spark within them, and I think that's inherent to what it is to be human. But it's largely a divine force that helps us live in such a way that we belong to one another in the human family, not only in the human family, but the earth family, because I believe that all of nature has this spark as well. But it's that force for good that sends us to create a world that's more equitable and loving and just. outside and didn't like what you see or am i the only one who sees the things we could be if we would make more of an effort then i think you'd agree that we could make the world a better place a place that is free life is really what you make of it you gotta give and take a bit someone's always up and someone's always in a pit someone has too much and someone dreams of more and someone's wondering why they didn't see this all before and every now and then someone comes to try to take me down but i keep moving forward try again and rising from the ground and if i have to man i'll even go another time around until i finally overcome no more ties to keep me bound now i'm walking on the sound with the music as my cover thought that I was out of tricks Look again, here's another Even with a thousand crashes I will rise up from the ashes And do something with my time Before my eyes, my life flashes Gotta bring change from the inside out Gotta stand up, lift my voice and shout Gotta turn it around From the streets of the cities To the government games From the homeless and the shelters To the buildings and flames We gotta turn it around